Hello everyone, hello and welcome to the Cloud English Podcast. It is Friday, December 2nd, 2097. And we are going to be talking today about homes. Rather, we're going to be discussing and exploring homes. And, you know, it's going to be a little more freestyle. We're going to be sort of diving into it and then picking out idioms and words, useful vocabulary. I hope by doing it more in a, an exploratory way, it will be a little bit more realistic. Sometimes if you just go through one thing and then another thing and another thing and try to memorize the words, it doesn't have the, the sense of kind of digging through it. So we're going to be doing that. It's going to be an exploration of different styles of homes, the rooms in your home, how those are described, right? We're going to be talking about uh, home home prices and when you see a listing on an, uh, an app or website where you would find a home, all the stuff kind of around that. We're going to be talking about the furniture and the stuff inside the room itself and how you can describe that. Some interesting vocabulary we'll pick out. And as I said, we'll, we'll look at a few idioms as well, but it's going to be kind of freestyle. So here's what I'm thinking. This is more of an update. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Appreciate that. Let me smell it first. Has this been tested by poison control? You test it. Well, I don't try. I don't. You would be the one to poison it, probably. I need to set up an intermediary. Got my eye on you, Kathy. So it's going to be more of a, a sort of interesting exploration. And that's the kind of thing I want to do more on Fridays. A little bit more freestyle, a little more relaxed. And then on Wednesdays, my goal going forward will be completely focused on hardcore learning. So lessons, idioms, vocabulary, insights for learning, study methods, best practices, that sort of thing, straight through. Uh, not that I won't answer questions, but I might keep that to the end on Wednesdays. But Friday is going to be a little bit more sort of uh, loosey-goosey. <laughs> and then Saturday, uh, Saturday will be still I'm going to be doing the discussions with Mushroom. So if there's anything in particular that you would like Mushroom and I to talk about on Saturdays, let me know. Open to ideas. We have our ideas, our own ideas. The coffee ground on my tongue. Gross. Somehow that got in there. And that's um, that's the update. Now, if you haven't already done so, you can hit the like button and subscribe. That's a small action that you can take, which really supports what I do. Okay. So even if you don't, you know, buy courses or anything like that, if you want to just support, you can hit the like button and subscribe. It makes a big difference. So I appreciate that right off the top. And if you have questions, feel free to pop those in as we go along. And anything else? If you want to get a free course, check in the links in the description. It should be the first link that you see. There will be a link to a free course that you can grab. That is a one hour course about having natural English conversations. If you haven't picked that one up already, make sure you do that. Otherwise, you can check out my other courses if you like as well. Those are more sort of in-depth, specific topics, pronunciation, idioms, grammar, writing, all that stuff. And those are not free. Because uh, sometimes things are not free and huh? you got to pay for good stuff. The good stuff, the really good stuff, it, it's not free. All right. So as I said, we're going to be diving into this. Let's just jump straight into it. I would like to hear from you, whether you're watching or listening, if you're listening, it's kind of hard to leave comments, but you can hop over to YouTube and Facebook if you're just listening and, and put in your comments there. Um, what kind of, what style of house do you live in? 
What style of house is common where you live? What do houses usually look like? I'm not asking for any other reason than that I'm curious. I'd like to know. I really would. What is, what, 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 what general aesthetic or style do you see in your town, your city, your area, your country? And does it vary widely? I'll be talking through um, my sort of situation a little bit. But we're going to be looking at first architectural styles, different styles of houses. But broadly, I can say this, I think. Generally speaking, in cities in the United States, you have a mix of apartment buildings and houses. If you live in an apartment building, that doesn't mean that you have a nice one or a not nice one. It just means you live in a building that has many units. Okay, it's called units. Units are each, each thing that people live in. A unit might have two bedrooms, one bedroom, or it might be a studio. So if it has zero bedrooms and the bed and the living room and the kitchen are all in one big room, that is called a studio apartment. So, okay, what's the difference between a unit and an apartment? A, an apartment is when you're inside of it, you're talking about the living space. I live in an apartment. That is different in the UK. Sometimes they use the word flat. In the United States, we don't use the word flat. We only say apartment if it's in an apartment building. When you're talking about how many apartments are in a building, you might then start talking about them as units, right? Uh, the, th the, the units on the third floor are having a, a, there's a water leak or something like that. So you can say apartments, that's fine, but often you'll hear units as well. Just know, don't be confused if you hear units. We're also talking about apartments in an apartment building. So you can't say a unit building. It should be an apartment building. Okay, but there are different types of apartments in apartment buildings. So you have this big building, and it might be a two-story building, a three-story building, a four-story building, a 100-story building. So why do we use story? We use story often when we're on the outside looking at it. Oh, that is a 50-story building. Can you say a 50-floor building? Generally not. Generally, you use the word floor when you're inside of it. For example, getting in the elevator, going up. Uh, let's go up to the 32nd floor, the fifth floor. I live on the fifth floor. Usually you won't say I live on the fifth story. You'll say I live on the fifth floor. But if we're on the outside, we'll say that's a five-story building, for example. Then there's another classification. Okay, so the main area, you have two words for it. One word is lobby, and that's the most common. L-O-B-B-Y, lobby. The other word sometimes we hear is mezzanine, and it's a similar idea, right? But the lobby is the common word for the first floor area. Depending on how nice the building is, you might have a doorman. A lot of big apartment buildings, really nice ones in New York City will have a doorman who stands at the door all the time. And then some of them, many of them, do not have a doorman. But the apartment may have what's called a super and the super takes care of the building. The super is different from the landlord. The landlord is the owner of the building or the owner of your apartment, and you pay the landlord rent. The super is employed by the apartment building or by the landlord to take care of things. So you call your super if something is broken, usually not your landlord, unless there is no super, and it's a very small sort of apartment building, but usually a larger building will have both a landlord and a super or multiple supers. I don't know why it's called a super. It's a good question. I'm not sure. So that's the situation. Then uh, you have on, on usually on the top a larger, nicer apartment or apartments, depending on the size of the building. And this is called the penthouse. This is the penthouse. So this may be near the roof. Usually it's at the top. And the penthouses are usually a little bit higher end, more luxury. 
And then the, so the building will have regular units, studios, one bedroom and two bedroom units, and then a penthouse or two at the top. And there's, there's a lot of variation there, of course. Some buildings, I think, maybe only penthouses. I'm not sure. But that's usually the distinction. Okay. So that's common in a city, but you do also see standalone houses. It's just that in a dense city like New York City, they will be less common than apartments. Most people will live in an apartment, especially in the city center. And then as you move outward, let's say, for example, in New York City, you move outward from Manhattan into the Bronx or into Queens or Brooklyn, and you start to see different types of houses. Now, in New York City, some of those are called townhouses or townhomes, and some of them are just called standalone houses. So a townhouse, and I'll show you a picture of a townhouse. If you're listening, I apologize, but I'll do my best to describe it. Townhouse. Brooklyn. I'm going to go townhouse, Brooklyn. And sometimes these are called brownstones in New York City, but we often use townhouse for these as well. So as you can see from the pictures, if you can see from the pictures, we have, it's a little different from an apartment, right? An apartment building, as we know, is just this big building and it's got a bunch of apartments. These, you have these what looks like apartments, but only two stories. So it's a two story building. And then each you have these different colors and each one looks like a standalone thing, but it is directly beside the, the next one. So they're sandwiched together and they're connected, in fact. So if you see these, right, if you look at these, this whole three story thing, that's for one person or one family, for example. It's not like someone lives on the first floor and a different person lives on the second. For a townhouse or a brownstone, townhouse is the more general word, you, you generally have, this is a good example here, you generally have one person living in this one with these steps. This is sort of a signature look for Brooklyn and in fact parts of Manhattan for these brownstones. You have these steps with railings going up and then two or three floors and then this is for one person or one family, but then there's one sandwiched right next to it, adjacent, no gap between them, and then that's another person and another family, right? That's generally how townhouses work, as opposed to, you know, apartment buildings. Apartment buildings. So if you look at an apartment building, we get, a lot of different variations. Some are high rise apartment buildings like this one here. These are all apartments. Some are lower. This one is one, two, three, four, five uh, floors. It's a, f it's a five story building, but you can see the first floor is for specifically for, it's called zoning. It's zoned for commercial use. So you have shop fronts and then second, third, fourth, and fifth floors are for residential use. So if you see commercial, that means there's business happening. If you see residential, that means people live there. And you know, there's so many different varieties. Look at this crazy apartment building here. Uh, it looks like a Minecraft city. And this is a common, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, really? That's in New York? This looks like what you get in, in China where you have buildings that look exactly the same because they were all built at the same time. And then they're in a sort of community area where, where in the middle of the buildings you'll have trees and kind of a park feeling, but it's private for the people who live in one of the buildings. But because all the buildings are meant to be together, they're designed together, built at the same time, and they have a common area, the whole thing is called an apartment complex. Okay, so then, and you get these standalone houses as you go further out of the city. And look, there's some Minecraft right there. As you go further out of the city, then you get a house, <laughs> what I would call a house. And there are, of course, many different styles of houses. We'll look at that next. But houses tend to have a couple of features, right? Number one, they're usually for one family. You sometimes get houses where they've rented out one room to a college student or something. Generally speaking, 
as you get more space, as you go out to the suburbs, right, you get more space, and so you get a, you get fewer apartment buildings, high-rise apartment buildings, and you get more standalone houses. And the typical thing is to have a house with a yard, right? And a yard is the grass around the house, and the house usually is not sort of a building shape with a flat roof, but it has a, usually a sloping roof. And of course, there are many different styles, but just searching the word house here pulls up a lot of similar looking things. There's one here, very modern looking house that has a different sort of modernist architectural style. And there are houses like that too. But the, the common characteristic is these houses usually are standalone. They are standalone structures and they're for usually one family. Each one is for one family or one sometimes one person. And this is a giant house. This house only costs $85 million. Once you get into the giant house territory, it's often no longer called a house. It is called a mansion. A mansion. So a large house that usually costs in the millions of dollars. This is $85 million is a mansion. Uh, which is a type of, we could say, a type of house, okay? Okay, so that's the general situation. And as you get into sort of, you know, small towns, like this, I'm from a small town, you do have some apartments. So many towns will have maybe a few apartment buildings. They'll tend to be smaller. So let's see if we can find a small apartment building. Often one or two uh, stories, something like, something like this. This is sort of a, a small apartment building with perhaps only four units, very small. Um, this is, I'm not quite getting the results I want. I'm going to search small town apartments. Here we go. Okay. Now we're maybe getting somewhere. Uh, this one looks similar. This is this is what I think of when I think of small town apartments. So maybe two story, low two story buildings in a small town, and then you'll have the units there. But most of what you see in the smaller towns are houses. Usually you're going to see standalone houses in smaller towns. I don't know what the percentages are, but but usually as you go away from the city, People will have a bigger yard. The yards get bigger the farther you go <laughs> from the city. And the houses may even get bigger as well uh, because more space costs less money, essentially. So that's sort of the general layout situation. And we're going to get into architectural styles. If, if you have you know ideas about this or you want me to search something or you want to share an interesting style, I'm all ears. I'd like to... You know, this is meant to be very, we're just exploring here. So I'd like to hear from you guys on that. But I'm just going to be exploring this stuff. Then we're going to get into furniture and room decoration, terms, vocabulary. We'll look at some words and also some idioms. Constantine is here. Hello, welcome. Riyadh is here. Hello. Uh... Home sweet home is a great expression. I love that one. So I'm going to pop up a new tab here and we'll go to the free dictionary and search that one. If you have other terms related to homes or phrases, we can search those as we go. Home sweet home. We should search under idioms. Home sweet home. Oh, there's actually a video about this. Home sweet home. An expression of pleasure or relief upon returning to one's home, especially after an extended period of time. Exactly. Ah, home sweet home. After two months in India, it sure is great to be back. That's right. So it's the thing that you say when you walk in the door of your home, you are away for a few days. Maybe you had a long day. It doesn't have to be a few days. Usually it's a vacation or a work trip or something. 
you walk in the door, you put your bag down and you go, ah, home sweet home, home sweet home. It's just a way to express that feeling, right? Constantine, welcome. I love, I, I live in a block of flats in a three room apartment. Uh, is that three room or three bedroom? Because that's different because a three room apartment might be, might not be all bedrooms. Usually when we talk about, and I'm glad that Constantine brought this one up. So Constantine says, I, I live in a block of flats uh, in a three room apartment building private house in the country, craving to start living there one day and um, build, Oh, building a private house in the country. Okay. So you're currently building a house in the country. Well, congratulations. I'd love to see it. Usually when we talk about apartments, we, excuse me, what was that coming from my throat? I'm going to drink more coffee. Usually when we talk about apartments, we, we count it in terms of bedrooms. Usually we don't say, I live in a six-room apartment. Well, what's a room? Because often the kitchen and the living room are connected, but sometimes they're separate. So if they're connected, is that two separate rooms, really? So it's kind of hard to count. So usually we say the bedrooms only, unless everything is connected, in which case it is a studio. So all one room, bed is in the same room as the kitchen is, they're all together. That is a studio apartment. But then if we have one bedroom and then a living room and a kitchen, that is a one bedroom apartment, not a two room apartment because it has a bedroom and a living room. If it has two bedrooms, one living room, one kitchen, several bathrooms, that's a two bedroom apartment. I used to live in a two-bedroom apartment in Queens. It had two bathrooms. So often when you see it on a listing website, you'll see 2BR, 2BR, two bedrooms, two bathrooms. Bedrooms is first, then bathrooms. If you see 2BR, 1BR on a listing to find an apartment, that means two bedrooms, one bathroom. If you see 2BR, 1.5BR, that means two bedrooms, one full bathroom, and then a second bathroom where it's just the toilet and the sink, and there's no shower or bath inside, right? So you can't take a shower there. That means there's only one room where you can take a shower or a bath, and there's one room where you can use the bathroom or restroom. It's still called a bathroom, even though there's no bath in it. And that's, a, that's a half bathroom. That's what that's called. It's called a half bathroom. Yes, Nihat is here, Maga is here, Yasser, and Vitali, and Cyril, and Amin. I love your lessons. Thank you so much, Amin. Hello, everyone. Yes, pop in the chat if you want. What, what is your living situation? Like Constantine did. What is your living situation? Do you live in the countryside? Do you live in the city? Do you live in the suburbs? Do you live in a standalone house? Do you live in a small apartment? Do you rent a room? Do you share a room? Do you live in a dormitory? Do you live in a tent? Do you live in the sewer? Do, do, where, do you live on a rooftop? Do you live in the clouds? I want to know. I want to know. <laughs> I'm desperate to know. Okay. Three rooms, a living room, a study, and a kid's room besides a bathroom and a toilet. Um... What about the bedroom, Constantine? Heckle says bachelor apartment, studio apartment. Bachelor apartment, yeah. In the United States, we tend not to use bachelor apartment. We tend to use studio apartment, right? And you could be a bachelor or not. I mean, lives in an apartment. Nice. Do you rent an apartment by yourself? Do you rent with roommates? What's the situation? Hello, Stephanie. Uh, what we're just talking about where we live, the, the living situation, um, studio apartment, one bedroom apartment, standalone house. Does anyone live in a mansion? If so, I'd love to hear about that. I currently live in a, uh, I, so before I lived in a two bedroom apartment in Queens, it was pretty comfortable for two people. 
except for the issue of noise because Mushroom and I both worked from home and because of that, I always heard her meetings and she always heard me ranting about stuff on <laughs> on YouTube and make and courses and stuff. And so we decided uh, it's a good time to to get a house. We looked in the immediate area and uh, we couldn't find a house that we really liked in the city, right? In the city, it's like a million dollars for, we'll look at some of some houses, but it's like a million dollars for a crappy house <laughs> this is in New York City. It's insane. So we, we, we wanted more space. So that wasn't really an option. So we looked a little further out and north of the city in the Hudson Valley, we found an area we really liked and it had a yard. And so finally we decided to, to get uh, a house, but we actually, instead of just buying it, we we built we built a house <laughs> that was an interesting process so now we're living in a three bedroom standalone house and it has a yard and it's really it's a really big change i don't hear mushrooms meetings anymore she doesn't hear me ranting about houses on uh, online anymore uh, or recording courses or whatever and we've got lots of space <laughs> it's, it's much better yeah um, I think I've shared, I've shared pictures of it as well, but, uh, you can see pictures of it on Mushroom's Instagram. If you search Shroomster, you can check her out on Instagram. Cyril says, I live in a three bedroom house in the countryside in France. Oh my goodness, Cyril, that sounds amazing. I'd love to see pictures of that. If, if you guys want to share pictures of where you live, you can do that in the discord. We have a discord community. It's free to join. Uh, you have to download Discord, uh, but you can check that out in the links. And I'd love to see pictures of where you guys live. That would be really cool. Can you load all of your lessons on YouTube to iPhone podcast app? I mean, that's a good question. Um, I will be, all future lessons will be there. The question about going back and re-uploading all of them, I'm considering, but it's also a lot of effort and I'm not sure. Yulin says, this is a British accent. No, I have an American accent. I wish I had a British accent, Yulin, but sadly, sadly, it is just a regular old American accent. It's just how I talk. That's how it is. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know how to use a British accent. It's, t it's difficult for me. I'm a simple, simple man. Okay. Um, Constantine says three rooms, a living room, study, and kids' room. That's besides a bathroom. Okay, and then no bedroom. We sleep in the living room. Okay, cool. That's a good setup. Can you load? Okay, I already read that one. All right. I want to see that house in France. Jeez, that sounds nice. That sounds really nice. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to look at different home styles. So we can call this architecture styles. But if we just say architecture styles, then we get into the area of sort of skyscrapers. I took a my first year of university, I took an architecture history of architecture class. It was the first class I ever attended when I went to university. It was really interesting. I loved it. I even considered studying architecture for a little while because I love that class so much. So there's so many different styles of architecture and each one kind of influences the other. Sometimes one is a response to the other, a reaction to the other. It's really fascinating. But since we're focusing on homes in this, in, in today's uh, uh, podcast, I want to stay on architectural styles for homes. After that, we're going to get into decoration and vocabulary, for example, for living rooms and kitchen and all of that stuff. And I hope you have lots of questions and lots of things to share because it's going to be just an exploration, right? As we do on Fridays. Um, so we're going to stick with home styles. 
So if we don't get into some things that you expect, that's probably because I don't really want to look at, you know, uh, uh, things that are specifically for museums, like Frank Gehry's crazy architecture for um, uh, the what? What? There's a there's a museum in New York, the Guggenheim, I think, is what he he did, and another one as well. But those are buildings, skyscrapers, museums. We're going to focus on houses, okay? Okay. So well, let's hop over here. And again, if you don't have the video, we're looking at we're looking at a website with a PDF, or it looks like it's an infographic that could be downloaded as a PDF of different home styles. Obviously didn't make this myself. Uh, we're on 99% invisible.org style house visual guides, domestic architectural. So domestic, if you hear the word domestic, it means home related. It's about homes. Okay. So iconic home design styles. Now this is actually my probably one of my favorite styles. It's called a Tudor style home, T-U-D-O-R, originating from England. Starting The starting date is 1485. Okay. So if, uh, just to describe it, it looks like it has these, it looks quintessentially European in my mind, right? And it has wood beams that go across and up across and then no siding, but instead it's sort of, I believe it's a kind of uh, stucco. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but uh, and then there's some brick elements and the windows have a kind of crossing pattern. Brick laid in a, in elaborate pattern on the first story. Stucco, that's the word I was looking for, stucco. Stucco is like mud. <laughs> stucco or wood with decorative trim on the second story and it has a steep roof so a steep roof goes like this and then a shallow roof goes like this so steep roof might be 50 degrees and a shallow roof might be 30 degrees or something like that i actually don't know what the exact rules are for those some uh, casement windows blah 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 and then Decorative half timbering. I don't know what that means. Roof, steep roof, prominent cross gables. Okay, I, I, I really love this. When we were first looking for a house, on because you can, there's a website called Zillow where you can search homes and you can put in requirements. I was only searching Tudor homes at first. <laughs> I was only interested in a Tudor style home because I don't like the traditional American home style with horizontal vinyl siding. We'll probably see it, what it looks like. I don't like it. It's just too boring. It's not interesting. So at first, for the first year of looking for a house, literally, I looked for nothing other than Tudor homes. <laughs> and we found a couple. We found a couple, but ultimately decided not to go with those because they weren't very nice inside. My house is my my house is unique, but it's not Tudor. My house is actually black. I live in a black house. The entire house is black. That sounds weird, I know. So Cape Cod. Cape Cod is a lot of people just call this a house. If you ask maybe 85% of Americans, what does a house look like? They're gonna say, they won't even say Cape Cod. They're just gonna say this <laughs> that we're looking at here. So it's got, uh, now this one has wood shingles, but you can't, you can't tell. They have a, uh, the roof is more shallow. And then horizontally, you have what's called siding, S-I-D-I-N-G. And siding is, is a type of thing that you would put sort of as the skin of the house, right? that protects it from wind and stuff. Now, one material that's used for siding that's very common, the most common, I would say, is called vinyl siding. Vinyl is the same material that's used to make the records. A vinyl record that you would use, the black record, that's vinyl too. So vinyl is a very strong 
material and it is often used for the outside of homes. The cladding, C-L-A-D-D-I-N-G, the cladding, the outside of the house. A lot of cladding is horizontal. So you have this vinyl material that is horizontal, goes from side to side, not up and down. If it's up and down, it's vertical. Vertical siding is becoming more popular. Horizontal siding has been the, the norm forever. And this house that we're looking at is sort of the most common, ordinary looking house that I've ever seen. Now the roof could be wood or it could be more common on the things on the top have what are called shingles, S-H-I-N-G-L-E-S. This one has wood shingles, which you can't, you can't really tell that it does, but um, the material for the normal house, I think is, it's a kind of, uh, actually don't know what it is. They're called architectural shingles, but I forget, they're made of sort of tar or marshmallows. I don't know what they're made of, actually. I actually am not sure. This one has a steep roof, but Yulin says it's very much like Chinese architecture. Really? I don't think it looks like Chinese architecture. I think a lot of Chinese homes, well, most people in China live in apartment buildings. Um, I lived in China for quite a while, and I always lived in apartments. But then sometimes you get into the suburbs, and then there are uh, uh, villas that may look kind of like this, but I think are generally a little nicer and don't have vinyl siding. So this is sort of like, oh, that's an American house type of house. Multi-pane windows. Oh, and these things beside the windows, which are very common, are called shutters. Shutters. That's what they're called because you can, well, and the, they used to be able to shut them to cover the windows. Now they're just purely decorative. If something has no function, basically no purpose, then it's called decorative. And if it's decorative, it's just there for looks. It's no, not, no other reason. It's decorative. So it's not functional. There's no function. Okay. Georgian style is a little bit more classical. This one also has shutters. This one is made of bricks, uh, occasionally decorated with wooden Quite queen coins q what is this word q u o i n s i don't i don't even know what that means q u o i n s what is that <sighs> external angle of a wall or building a wedge or expanding Mechanical device used for locking a... What the... Oh. Oh. Ah. Okay. All right. I know what that is now. I recognize that. Those are those look cool. Kind of a thing on specifically on the corners. How is it pronounced, though? Coin. 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 Oh, okay. I'm learning a lot here. All right, so this one, this this Georgian style might have co coins, wooden coins, stone or stucco or brick. I think this one is brick, we can see. And then uh, windows, small panes. So, so what is a pane? A window is the whole thing, right? But then inside the window, it's usually not one giant piece of glass. Some windows have four little windows inside with the frame, right? Each one of those little windows is called a pane. So a pane of glass, pronounced exactly the same as P-A-I-N, is, that's how we say each one of each one of those pieces. The whole thing is the window, and each piece of glass is the pane. Sometimes a window is only one top and one bottom piece, and that is, would be two panes, so different sizes. Entrances are often fitted with Pediments, broken pediments, arch tops, or oggy caps. What? O G E E. I'm just curious what that is. O G E E caps. What the heck is that? Okay, this looks like a kind of molding. So this is this is what I would call molding or trim, and it would be sort of a a pattern or a, a wood piece that's kind of decorated that goes along. Uh, along the floor or the ceiling. It looks like a type of trim. Okay. I actually don't care. So, 
Who cares? All right, let's move along because I want to get through this. After this, we're going to talk about the rooms, decorative styles. We're going to look at some properties as well. And uh, I'm so, you know, share away. Vitali says, I live in a four story. You can take out, take off the D there. Instead of storied, you can just say story. I live in a four story apartment block, which is one of those faceless stalagmites thrown up, <laughs> faceless stalagmites thrown up in the early 1960s and are uh, uh, ubiquitous across Russia. <laughs> That's a very creative phrasing. A faceless stalagmite. Faceless means it's kind of uninteresting to look at. A stalagmite in a cave is actually what you should say, I think, would be faceless stalag... No, stalagmite is right. So in a cave, you have uh, those things that go down and the things that go up. A stalagmite holds on from the ceiling. So that's the one that goes down. A stalag... No, stalactite goes down from the ceiling and the stalagmite comes up from the floor. So it's like a rising out of the floor, kind of. Yeah. All right. This is Greek revival. It looks kind of similar, honestly. Uh, revival means to bring something back inspired by Greece, constructed in the U.S. So maybe, yeah, some sort of... When I see this, I think, okay, clearly a wealthier person owns this home. Right, this is not your standard sort of American home. If you see this kind of house, it's usually a sort of um, wow, wow, nice. Uh, usually, usually they're more expensive. Colonial style. Now, if you look at the difference between the colonial and the Greek revival, this style they're bi often bigger and nice. They have a they're made of brick or wood. And the windows, uh, windows on each side of the entry door, five windows on the second floor, one of them above the entry floor. And when I see this, I think that is American, but it's sort of classically American. In the eastern U.S., colonial is the, when we hear the word colonial, we think of colonial times like the time when the United States wasn't the United States, but was a colony of England. And so you have these larger houses that are big, but very simple. And so this kind of reflected the time. The time was, there was a, the value of the time was don't show off. You can have something nice, good quality, right? It can be big, that's fine, but just don't show off. Nothing crazy or fancy because it was a reaction to the sort of a uh, super wealthy look of a lot of things happening in Europe. There was a response in uh, people who came over to the new world to live a simpler life. Religion was part of that, to not show off, to be modest, to be humble, to not so not have crazy decorations everywhere, right? Very different from sort of the... Um, Gothic Revival, maybe we could say. Gothic Revival, very pointy. Very pointy. You don't see too many of these houses in the United States, honestly. Style of origin, England and France. Roof, steep, complex. Yes. Okay, we're going to go through these quickly. I just want to sort of get a sense for them because I want to move on to some other stuff. Uh, tal ita Italian, Italianate? I don't know how to say that correctly. Italian sort of influence. Corinthian columned porches. So those porches are called Corinthian columns. And middle class homes. Wealthy homes, stone or brick. Flat roof. Two over two double hung windows. So very different style. The Gothic Revival is extremely pointy roof and very narrow windows. And each, sort of, there looks like there are sort of modules in the house has three, three sort of pieces. And the, this one and the Greek revival and the colonial style are one big piece. And uh, wider windows, more shallow roof. Uh, all right. Stick East Lake. I've never heard of that. Let's call it Victorian. 
Stephanie, yes, Stephanie has black pink, a back black pink icon, as everyone should. I'm thinking about changing my icon to black pink as well. First, Dearborn, Illinois, renamed Chicago, Illinois. Style of origin, the United States. So this one, this one is pretty common. You see this one pretty often. It still looks a little older. A lot of modern houses aren't built to look like this. But it's called a Victorian style house. And it usually has one piece or one part of the house is narrower and stands up higher than the rest of the house. Kind of like a, a spire. And it has a, a cone shape on the top of that. And uh, that, that usually makes it look really unique. Steep, gabled roof. Small vertical, horizontal, or diagonal planks placed on top of the exterior walls. Okay. Another Victorian-style house, a little different. This is the one that has the little fences on top. I don't know what those fences are for. F for tower, wrought iron galleries or crests above the upper cornice. Uh, the crests, I think, are those little fences. Balconies, small entry porch. This style uh, you see sometimes, but it's not very popular anymore. Queen Anne. This is also common. In my hometown, there are a lot of Queen Anne style homes. This also has the one piece that's kind of round or circular and then a cone on top. And it's a, it originates from the Victorian style house. Uh, Victorian being in, in England, there was an era known as the Victorian era during the reign of Queen Victoria and a whole style of dress and literature and art and architecture came out of that. Uh, okay, shingle style. All right, let's see what, let's just, let's just look and see if there's more interesting stuff. I want to move through this. Craftsman. Uh, this is pretty common. This might be the second most common style of house that you'll see. Siding, wood or stone. This style of house has a low shallow roof and it has pillars beside the door and uh, it is usually pretty small. You often see this style of house in the suburbs. Cottage style. Originating from England. Steep overhanging roof and it has small window panes. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of cottage style houses too. I've seen I've seen many of those. Let me just quickly search that cottage style home. Cottage style home. Oh, okay. Well, that's a, just a cottage, but cottage style home, the more modern cottage style home, maybe more like this one here where it has a sort of uh, porch walkway around it and a chimney, different materials used on the outside. Yeah. All right. All right. So you get the idea. You can look through, just Google American home styles or, or home architectural styles, Mediterranean, mid-century modern, traditional ranch. That one's really common. Contemporary. There are a lot. Okay. So we have a sense for the different styles. I want to actually dive into, I want to actually dive into the uh, um, things inside the house, decorations and so on. Stephanie says, kind of reminds me of Full House, the sitcom. So in, in Full House, there are three, there are, there's a, a view in Full House because they live there, I believe, in the show. They don't really live there. But in the show, they live in a specific place in San Francisco. And you can visit it. And the um, the ladies in San Francisco. Uh, it's a specific style of home. Oh, the excuse me. The painted ladies is what they're called. And painted ladies are these houses that are very close together. Um, they are a uh, sort of iconic style from this sitcom called Full House that was popular in the 90s. And you can, when you go there, you stand in a park. There's a park and then you, I've, I've been there. You see the painted ladies sort of in this, 
on this hill and they're not so they're not totally straight so they go down the hill a little bit which looks really interesting and then behind that you get a view of the city so it's kind of an iconic view and i think that's why they used it in the show full house so these are the painted ladies um that's what that's the view you get so it's a pretty nice view this series of houses this row of houses here with a with the view of the skyscrapers and big buildings in San Francisco right behind. I don't know if I ever actually watched Full House, though. I don't know if I've ever seen uh, Full House. Does anyone live in the Painted Ladies? There are two. These are two of the reasons they're also called Postcard Row. You'll find them, blah, blah, blah. Does anyone live in them? Yes, all seven are privately owned, and not you're not allowed inside of them. Nice. People live in all of them, as they should. Why would they be... Why would they be empty just because of the show? Nice. So that's a nice view if you go to San Francisco. Uh-oh, we've got spam happening. Uh-oh. The typical feature of New England is the cottage-style courtyard. English country style. Yes, yes. New England, New England cottage style. Let's look at a New England cottage style home. Yeah, we get the same sort of look. I think, uh, well, let me actually search Google Images. New England cottage style homes. They're quite cute and approachable, friendly, right? I, th I feel like the, the cottage style home is very approachable. It doesn't feel uh, unwelcoming when you see it, whereas a sort of modern modern home, modern architecture is, I think, cool, but kind of unfriendly. A lot of straight lines and gigantic windows and uh, sort of hard, hard edges. Uh, and there's something about the sort of modern house plan, uh, house architectural style that, that while beautiful, is not very welcoming compared to uh, maybe a cottage style home. That's just my opinion though. All right, anyway, so feel free to do more research on your own if you're interested in different architectural styles. That's about the unfriendliest home I've ever seen. It looks like a prison. My God, I, I wouldn't want to live there. Although something like this would be a good compromise. This one is uh, Still has large windows, but it's got warm, soft lighting and a lot of different angles. The roof uh, has has different angles. Some are flat and some are shallow and some are steep. And the landscaping, so the area around the house with the stones and the trees and the bushes, that's called your landscaping, including your grass. Landscaping is an important part of the house because it's the sort of, it's the first impression people get, right? That's your landscaping. So inside you have decoration and then outside you have landscaping. And this landscaping I think is very, uh, very beautiful. Uh, the outside of the house. Shrubs, bushes, the lighting, the all of the stuff outside, the grass. Interesting. Okay. And that's usually a big project. I we have we didn't do any landscaping our first year because we were focused we were focusing all of our attention on the inside of the house, decorating the inside, the guest room, everything except for my office is still undecorated. But then the next year the big project is going to be landscaping on the outside of the house. I'll probably have to hire a company to come and do all of the all of the the landscaping. Um, landscaping, landscaping design. So this is, I mean, this is crazy landscaping. That's maybe too complicated. Basically looks like a public garden. I don't know if that's someone's home, probably not. Many different types of flowers, trees, bushes, too much. It's too much. But if you live there, that would be really nice. So a lot of home landscaping, people will have either what's called stone or mulch. Mulch is made of wood. It's sort of like wood chips. 
Some some of them are brown, some of them are reddish, some are some lighter, darker colors. And you would use that to surround the house, usually in a sort of organic shape. You have an organic shape dug out around the house. Then you put mulch there, and the mulch will slowly decompose and decay, which is good for the things that you plant there. And then you might have a stone walkway through that so people can walk through it, as you can see here. And then you might plant different things. Shrubs is a general word for a sort of low tree, a bush as well. And flowers, there are some types of flowers that grow back every year called perennials and some called annuals, which just grow once and then you have to plant again the next year. So a lot of people will have perennial flowers and then shrubs, bushes, and other little plants around the house in that organic shape, right? And then there will be what's called a sidewalk leading up to the house and a driveway. So the driveway is where the cars go up and down, maybe into a garage. Some people have a garage, some people don't. But if you have a garage, you park your car there. For people who park outside your house, then you have a walkway, usually made of concrete, called a sidewalk. Sidewalk, S-I-D-E-W-A-L-K, landscaping idea. Why not ideas? Okay, so you can see sort of the sidewalk might be made of concrete. It might be made of stones. It might have different materials, but it's just a place for people to walk usually up to your front door. So the sidewalk, you can have a sidewalk beside the street too. That's also called a sidewalk. But the sidewalk or walkway in front of your home usually connects the driveway to the front door. And the front door may or may not be on a porch. So let's get into the house itself, okay? So a porch is often the front area covered by a small roof. You might have a couple of chairs there and some decorations, some flowers. You can see some flower pots here and some hanging lights leading up to the front door. This is when you welcome people into your home. They, they usually walk through, you're giving them a path through your beautiful landscaping up to the front door. When they get to the front door, hopefully they've had a good first impression, right? Then you, you, they come in and now they're in your entryway. The entryway is the sort of first thing that you arrive in when you go into a traditional style home. There may be other entrances. There may be a back door as well, but usually when guests come, they don't come through the back door. They come through the front door because maybe you've got dirty boots and stuff in the back door and that's where you go in and out of. Sometimes, for example, my home also has another entrance through the garage because when you park your car in the garage, you might, um, you might close the garage door. So many garages... You might have like a two-car garage, okay? And you park your car in the garage, the garage door closes, so it obviously doesn't make sense to open the door again and go out and all the way around to the front door. So usually there's a door directly connecting the garage, you get out of your car, to the house. That's not the door you usually bring your guests through. That's your, your door. So 99% of the time when I enter my house, I'm entering through the garage door through the, the, the door that's connected to the garage because I drove into the garage. And then if people come over, they're coming through the front door, even though I have terrible landscaping right now, via the sidewalk. And there is a back door, but that's more for going into the backyard where there is a patio. And Stephanie said, what is a patio? So while we're outside, we've got the porch, We've got the sidewalk, we've got the landscaping, the bushes and all that stuff looks nice. What about the, the back? So you have two things that people have in the back of their homes. One is called a patio, P-A-T-I-O, and one is called a, uh, a deck. So there's, P, there's porch, and porch is usually the front with the little roof on top. And if, it's, if it has windows around it, then it's an enclosed porch. Hello, Amar. Welcome. Walla, hello. Um, and then the deck 
may also have a roof over it. Sometimes, sometimes not. And the patio may also have a roof over it. So what's the difference between a deck and a patio? All right, that's a good question. So if someone <laughs> if someone looks at my Google search history, they're going to think that I'm obsessed with houses. <laughs> it's a weird search history. <laughs> Small town apartments, Augie caps, painted ladies, modern home, sidewalk landscaping ideas. <laughs> I think I'm a psychopath. <laughs> home decoration psycho. Um, by the way, you see this here. That sometimes people have one front door and sometimes people have a double door. Double doors or uh uh, double doors or French doors, both open. And then sometimes people have one front door. And then if it's a, it goes like this, then it's a sliding door. And often people have sliding doors in the back. Usually you will not find someone who has a sliding front door. That would be really weird. But people will have a sliding back door to the patio or the port uh, or the deck. I don't know. Why is that? Um, convenience, I think because you want to go in and out often if you're having a barbecue in the backyard, but the front door you don't maybe don't open as often. I don't know the reason, but it'd be very weird to have a sliding front door. Usually the front door will be French doors or a single front door uh, or double doors. You can see that in this picture. Okay, so let's let's get a sense for a patio. A patio, a patio is usually large stones, big square stones or irregular shaped stones or sometimes concrete. Concrete, people often consider concrete kind of ugly for that sort of thing. So stones, large stones are also called flag stones, right? And this is a, this is your outdoor hangout spot. It may have a roof over it. It may not. I currently have a patio, but it doesn't have a roof over it. I'm planning to put a roof over it eventually, but right now it is just a large area that goes out of the back of the house and is made of big square stones. And there's there are a couple of chairs there. There's a, a gas line that goes to a fire thing that, so you can have an outdoor fire. And when you want to hang out in your backyard or have a barbecue, have a party, have friends over, that's where you go. So I'll search patio. And there are many different types. Here you have a brick patio smaller stones here generally though it's stones this one looks like it's little stones this one has this one looks like it's larger stones um, you can see that there's a fire pit here surrounded by a little low stone wall an umbrella for shade and some of course landscaping here's a beautiful patio uh, some people will, will have a patio a large patio with different seating areas, and then a fireplace, a stone fireplace for especially in the summertime. Some people will have a covered patio. So this one has a little roof over it. It's still outside though, right? But it's covered so there's shade during the summer and in case it rains. Here's a 3D rendering of a patio. This one has, it looks like, a small seating area, a fire pit in the middle, or maybe that's a table. There's on the on one side, there is a grill and this grill would be where people would cook stuff outside. If you have a cookout or a barbecue, you go out of your back door onto your patio. This one looks like it's made of little uh, little stones. They're not bricks. Um, they're, they're just small gray stones. And then you have this seating area. This looks like maybe a bench. I'm not sure what that is. This looks like an outdoor fire fireplace. Usually that's just for decoration because it looks nice but then the cooking happens over here on the grill this is probably a propane tank maybe that's garbage i'm not sure but this might be eh, that, i think that's garbage but the grill will have a propane tank usually and you cook burgers there and hot dogs and meat and different things there and you hang out with your friends it's surrounded by some nice plants so this is probably a plan from a landscaping company Okay, so what's the difference? Now, this is this looks weird to me because you have this single small door that looks like it opens like a traditional door onto the back patio or deck. And that, that seems strange to me. There, I would usually have sliding doors. As Yulin said and as Stephanie said, 
Um, sliding doors are sliding doors are actually most common for the backyard to go between the kitchen and the patio. That's the most common place for them between the kitchen and the patio, right? So you can easily keep it open or slide it open or slide the main door open and you have another door, which is a screen door, which keeps flies out and that allows air to come in and out, but not bugs, right? Uh, so let's see. Let's see, sliding door. And we also need to differentiate, differentiate that from a deck. So deck, I'm going to search deck, D-E-C-K. So decks are made of wood and decks are raised higher than, um, than a patio. A patio is directly on the ground with the stones and a deck is raised up two or three feet and often has a wooden railing around it. It usually doesn't require you to step down from the back door. Instead, you directly step out onto the deck. This one is a really nice example of a deck. Also a seating area. I don't think they have a grill here, but they could easily put they could easily put a grill here if they wanted to. And this is from Pinterest. And they could put a grill here. They have a railing around it. This this thing around the outside is called a railing. R-A-I-L-I-N-G. And uh, uh, there's some stone around the, the base of this. But, the, okay, here's the downside about a deck. When we were in the process of building our house, we had the choice. Do we want to have a deck or a patio? And we had to decide, deck or patio. We decided to go with a patio instead of a deck for a couple different reasons. There's something, in my view, a little more classic about a patio. I feel that being on the ground on stone, it's just more natural feeling you're close to the ground when you want to go out into your yard. And the raised deck, it just feels, I don't know, it feels not as good in my opinion, but also the maintenance of a deck is really annoying. I grew up in a house with two decks and you all, every couple of years you have to, you have to restain it or repaint it or scrape it. And it starts to look bad after a few years because it rains. A deck is made of stone or concrete. It looks the same all the time. Uh, sorry, a patio is made of stone and concrete, but a deck, because it's made of wood, wears out and fades, and you, it requires a lot of maintenance. So we decided to go with a pat patio instead of a deck. I actually don't, I don't really like decks, but that's just my opinion. I, I just don't really like how this looks compared to a patio. Now, as for which is more expensive, I think they're probably about the same, probably about the same. Although I would say usually patios are common for nicer houses. People will usually go with a patio because you can do a lot with the different stonework and things like that. Okay. And then sliding back doors, sliding back doors. All right. So, so can we get a, can we get some sliding back door? Okay. There, there you go. I mean, that's, there you go, kind of ish. You think a deck looks more luxurious than a patio? I t I don't agree with that, but to each their own. I I think patios look kind of cheap and tacky, in my opinion. My opinion. Ooh, there's a nice. This is a nice one. Why don't? Why am I not getting large views here? Why Why is everything so small? But there's a nice sliding back door. There you go, sliding doors. Sliding doors. There you go. There you go. <laughs> nice. Okay, let's go inside the house, shall we? Let's go inside the house. When you're in the house, you're in a room of some kind. Now, the lines between rooms are kind of fuzzy, especially with the rise in popularity of Alejandro, filter images by size, good idea. Especially with the rise in popularity of what are called 
open floor plans, right? It used to be, was very popular for each room in the house to be totally separate. The study, the bedroom, the kitchen, the living room, the dining room, all of these, the pantry, the bathroom. Nowadays, the bedrooms and the bathrooms tend to be isolated, totally separate, right? So, of course, you want a bathroom to be a, a private place, so it should, be a, it should not be connected to anywhere else. You need to close the bathroom door, use the bathroom, take a shower. You want privacy. Same with the bedroom. You want privacy in your bedroom. You want that to be clearly separate from everything else, right? Now, often a home will have a bathroom attached to the bedroom. So you go into the bedroom and then there's a bathroom connected that you can only get to through the bedroom because usually if it's the main bedroom of the house, it is only used by the people who are in that bedroom. That's called the master bedroom and the master bathroom, right? So you might have, let's say, okay, three bedroom, three bathroom home. The main bedroom where the owners of the home sleep, that is the master bedroom. Their be bathroom, which is connected to their bedroom, is called the master bathroom. Typically, the only people who go in there and spend time there are the people who own the home, the people who live there. Then you have other rooms and other bathrooms, but they don't necessarily have special names unless it is specifically a guest room. So if a room is dedicated for guests, that is a guest room. And if it's a guest room, that means it's a bedroom for guests. And then the other bedrooms are just called bedrooms. You don't say like second bedroom or something. It's just the bedroom, 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 bedroom. And you would say the bedroom on the second floor, bedroom on the first floor, for example. Same thing for bathrooms. Generally, we usually say bathrooms, even if there's no bath in it, it's still called a bathroom. You don't say necessarily guest bathroom unless it's completely only dedicated for guests. But let's say in this three bedroom, three bathroom home, you have the master bedroom, master bathroom. Then you have a bathroom on the first floor and a bathroom on the second floor. And then two bedrooms on the second floor. And one bedroom is a guest room. All right, there you go. That's it. That's how it works, right? So for the other things, it started to change because it became more popular to have what's called an open floor plan. And uh, Heckel says, heckling me, of course, uh, pictures. Okay, so let's search open floor plan. Open floor plans tend to, and this, is, this has become the norm, I think, for a lot of more modern homes. Modern homes tend to still have room names but not have as longer any longer clear lines between the rooms so you still have a kitchen you still have a living room you still have a dining room you still have a study but it's not so clear what exactly the line is between the study the dining room the living room because it's an open floor plan that means there's no walls and doors between the rooms, right? It, it's, it's all open, right? So this is a perfect example, I think. And I apologize for the resolution, but you get the idea. You can see very nice house. Looks like a really tall ceiling. Over here on the right, that is a large table, clearly for eating. And that is obviously the dining room table. So that is a dining room area. It's hard to call it a room though, isn't it? And then on the left here, you have what is obviously the living room area. And there might be a TV over here, right? And that is a uh, coffee table. This is called a coffee table. And then you can see in the distance there, this is a big house. You can see a kitchen. But again, the kitchen is connected to everything else. So in, a same, in the same way as a bachelor apartment, or a studio apartment, you have this open sort of thing, except the bedroom is not included. So it's like a studio apartment now, the modern sort of modern trend of home design. It's like a studio apartment, except there are separate bedrooms. But the living room, the dining room, and the kitchen especially are all in one 
big room. And there's another, there's another great example, I think. So you can see the kitchen there. And then I don't see the dining area, but living room area and kitchen connected. Oh, there, there's the dining room area behind. Oh, pros and cons of open floor plans. Ooh, okay, interesting. Well, let's not read that now. And you can see there in the in the far away that that kind of light will will hint to you, will sort of suggest, okay, that bingo, that's that's a dining area. You see this sort of horizontal longer light is usually over the dining table. So you have now, okay. So what are these things called? You have here that is your looks like patio, living room, sofa or couch. What's the difference between a sofa or couch? There is no difference. Here, a large rug, R-U-G rug. A coffee table. It's called a coffee table, even if it has nothing to do with coffee. A side table. Side table, usually for a light, or you can put drinks on it. And then in the kitchen, and then this thin table behind the sofa, I usually say sofa instead of couch. This thin table behind, sometimes you'll see one in the entryway of a house. Sometimes you'll see one behind the sofa. It's very common to put one right behind the sofa. This is called a console table, C-O-N-S-O-L-E, console table. Then in the kitchen, we'll look at more detailed pictures of kitchens. You have the island, and just like island, I-S-L-A-N-D, it's the island. Many kitchens, not all kitchens, have an island. Again, this is not for all homes, but this is a very, I think, especially in America, an extremely common layout for homes. It's really common. So you have in the kitchen, you have your countertops, C-O-U-N-T-E-R. Counter is where you do everything in the kitchen. And then the countertop is the actual top sort of material. Sometimes that's granite, which is a type of stone. Sometimes marble. Sometimes it's wood. Sometimes it's uh, laminated coating, different types of countertops. And then at the island, you usually have what are called counter stools. So a stool, S-T-O-O-L, would be exactly like you have at a bar. There's a difference between a counter stool and a bar stool. Bar stools are taller because they're at a bar. You sit higher up at a bar. And if you're sitting at a counter, usually it's a lower, a little bit lower, usually the same height or a little higher than a regular kitchen table, a little, a little higher than a kitchen table. So there's still stools. They're higher than chairs, but they're not as high as bar stools. So bar stools, usually when you buy, I know this because I had to do it recently. When you go onto a, a website to buy a stool, stools.gov, and you search for stools, you might find one you really like. Ooh, I really like that. Then you see that that stool comes in two sizes. It comes in counter height and bar height, bar stools and counter stools. And the, the counter ones are a little bit lower. And then you have um, the you know, sometimes a dishwasher, an oven, a stove top. We'll look at more of this in detail and a range above it and a pantry. Pantry is where you put a lot of the food that you have, snacks and chips and cereal and all of that food you might have. That goes in a little, sometimes it's a closet, sometimes it's a cupboard, sometimes it's a little room and that is called the pantry, okay? All right, so open floor plan, Again, yeah, it's not universal, Amar says, uh, or Stephanie says, it's odd applying this pattern to all rooms. Maybe just to the living room or kitchen would be fine. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that, except, yeah, it's, it's, it's so common to have this that I think it's probably, you know, the best representation. Um, let's see here. Another open floor plan, living room. But you can see there, the common characteristics are all there. Even though the shape is different, it's still the same thing. And it's, it, that's why I'm saying it's so common in America. Sofa, side table, coffee table, kitchen, island, dining room, <laughs> microwave, oven, stovetop, sink. 
We'll go to the kitchen in a second. Marilo, why is side table so funny to you? Side table, ha, 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 ha. Dishwashers are attached to cabinets, right? Yes, they are. Uh, we'll look at a kitchen, I think, next. And a rug. They usually have a rug. And I feel like every home I go into is the same. Because I, I, I had to... I did a lot of house tours when we were looking for a house and <laughs> the floor plans, they, there are variations in the floor plan, different styles, but I saw so many s similar layouts. But if you watch old TV shows from the 1940s and 50s, it's very different. You don't see a lot of open floor plans. Now, the kitchen is a separate room and the living room is a separate room and the study is a separate room. And the dining room is a separate room. Every, everything, you go into the next room through a door. And you open the door. <laughs> Which now to me seems weird. But if you watch old TV shows from the 1940s, that's what you see. Uh, in Portuguese, the translation of side table is funny. I'm, I'm very curious what the translation of side table means then. Please tell me. I'm desperate to know. Okay. So yeah, I think you can see the common common characteristics here. That's a nice one. And I think the general style we could call the decoration we're seeing here is maybe contemporary. Contemporary is similar to modern. But then there are very different aesthetics, decoration aesthetics, and we'll get into that too. Where do people sleep in open plant, open floor plants? Well, as I said, Heckel, we're only talking about here the kitchen, the dining room, and the living room. And maybe the, maybe the study too, but kitchen, dining room, living room. And there may be a separate study as well. But then when we talk about bedrooms, when we talk about bathrooms, that's totally different, okay? Bedrooms and bathrooms are absolutely separate with their doors. They're closed off 100%. It's only the common living area, cooking area, eating area that is one big area. So, and that's it. what the typical thing I guess would be all of the common area stuff is on the first floor, and then the bedrooms are on the second. Sometimes the master bedroom is on the first floor, and sometimes it, they're all on the second floor. For a normal house, it has, well, well I don't want to say normal. Some houses, they only have one floor, and everything is spread out, including the bedrooms. And like my, my mother, her home, it's a very nice home, it has this open floor plan, it has three bedrooms, and... They're all on the first floor. Everything is on the first floor. But the bedrooms and the bathrooms are separated. The doors are closed during the day. And then uh, some people live in a two-story home. And then on the second floor, they'll have the bedrooms. So that'll be a little taller. Some people have a three-story home, which I think is increasingly less common. Ah, time for a coffee break. Oof. Ugh. There's a great Netflix show. Uh, what is it called? About home decoration, where they renovate homes. Uh, what is it called? Netflix. Your dream home. Is that what it's called? Is that it? Yes. Ah, this this is the show. This is a good show. If you want to get a sense for a co common. Again, there are a lot of variations, right? Some people like very minimal. Some people like farmhouse. Um, we can look at some of that. But but if you want to get a sense for, I guess, it's hard. I hate saying the word normal, okay? But common, normal-ish sort of stuff. Uh, this is a really good show on Netflix. 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 <laughs> Netflix. It's called... Dream Home Makeover. And it's a couple with two kids. And she, he just kind of hangs out, I think. I'm not sure what he does. But she is a very good interior designer and decorator. And she does goes around to people's homes and helps them renovate a room or sometimes a whole home. And make it really beautiful, including knocking down walls and completely restructuring the home. And one of the common things that happens is people will buy 
an older home from like the 1930s or 40s or 50s and they want to modernize it. So what they'll do is they'll knock down a bunch of walls to have a more open floor plan because that's sort of the trend. Uh, uh, they don't like to have that closed feeling. But anyway, that show on Netflix is really good. I really like it. I like it a lot. They're very likable. Dream Home Makeover, season one and season two. And her aesthetic, I think, is sort of... Well, um, maybe we can quickly... Interior design aesthetics. Let's just very quickly fly through this, okay? Mid-century modern. I think her style is kind of sometimes like mid-century modern. Uh, mid-century is the previous century, the 20th century modern style. Uh, sometimes she uses that. Industrial, everything is hard lines, straight edges. It looks like you're in a sort of uh, a hospital. I'm not a big fan of industrial. Eclectic is often very wacky, a lot of different shapes and really unique furniture and uh, nothing is regular, nothing matches, different colors, different patterns. Uh, eclectic, it looks, like a, it looks like a Salvador Dali painting. Uh, modern farmhouse is very popular. I think she does a lot of modern farmhouse. Certain aspects of my house, the outside of the house is called modern farmhouse actually. The inside is more minimal, but the outside is modern farmhouse. So it's clean and there are straight lines, but then some of the decorations are more sort of organic and woody, a lot of wood, um, so that you can see the stools and the chair. It's kind of a mix of friendly, but very clean lines and clean colors. Uh, modern country, this is, yeah, very sort of modern but a lot of a lot of wood and they use a lot of the original materials like a barn i stayed in a hotel recently and it was made out of a a, a barn from the 12th century and it still had the original wood but it had been renovated to look really beautiful and interesting so you get a lot of that art deco that's sort of early 20th century it's also an architectural style but there's a lot of little ornate patterns repeating patterns and symmetries and it gives a sort of classical classical feeling i think asian zen i really like this uh, uh some of the stuff in our house is kind of this style there's a lot of japanese inspired stuff clean lines very minimal and simple decorations very minimal and simple uh feng shui i i guess is Similar to Asian Zen, I think, but Asian influence is, I think, to use light colored wood and very simple uh, surfaces, not a lot of patterns, not very ornate and complicated. And I don't know where, why they don't have minim minimal here, but um, I would say the style we went with is kind of a mix for, I mean, for our interior decoration. Uh, we went with kind of the house itself is modern farmhouse and then the inside is kind of a mix between Asian Zen feng shui but also there's some mi minimalism I don't know what to call it but it's kind of minimalist style anyway we like it I'll share some pictures uh, on the discord if you like if you're interested let me know I can share some pictures of the house because we spent a lot of time decorating it. And it was a really fun and interesting process. Yulin says the lines of mid-century modern are very simple and hard. I agree with that. What style? So what styles do you like? What kind of uh, design aesthetics do you like? Do you like minimal? Do you like... I mean, one style that we didn't really look at is sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's Victorian, but there's also... Um, renaissance age um renaissance style is this interior that's outside i want to see renaissance uh what is the uh Nap napoleon uh, style decoration yeah, is this is this what it's called napoleon style? This is probably my least favorite style of decoration 
is is there another way to describe this or is it just napoleon style it's the first word that came to mind but this is sort of like donald trump's apartment a lot of gold and ornate furniture sort of the look from the uh you know 18th uh, 19th century 18th 19th century maybe european extremely ornate a lot of uh etching and gold and chandeliers and complicated patterns and i just i just really really don't like it can you i can't picture living in something like that but and you have uh in my view, it's a very tacky, T-A-C-K-Y. Just my opinion. Uh, Donald Trump's home. I'm <laughs> just curious here. I want to see the inside. I'm pretty sure he has that sort of, that, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so can you, how can you live in something that looks like this? How can you just sit on the sofa and play with your phone when you're surrounded by gold and little leaves and leaves and 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 pillars and crazy curvy chairs and 18th century paintings i don't know it just seems marble it just seems really uncomfortable i really hate it so much i hate it so much it's garish absolutely ottoman style is that what it is i'm i'm struggling to find the correct word I want to say Napole Napoleonic style, but um, Ottoman style home decor. Amar says, <laughs> how can you fart in that place? Exactly. That's a perfect question. If you're sitting on that golden chair, are you going to feel relaxed enough to fart? I think that's the key question. That's the ultimate question. No, this is not what I'm looking for. Ottoman style home decor. No, no, no. This is not what I want. Maybe like this over here. So it's con the reason that the, the search results are confused is because an Ottoman, O-T-T-O-M-I-N, is, is a thing that you rest your feet on. And it's usually square or round, and it may or may not have wheels. I think not. And you put your feet on it to rest them. Um, uh, but then Ottoman is also, I think, the name of a decorative style. And most of our search results appear to be the foot thing. Um, but maybe maybe this... I, I honestly don't know. Uh, um, I don't know. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of similar. It's not quite as ornate. That's the word I was looking for. Ornate is kind of a complicated, complex, uh, ornate decorations. Yeah, this is ornate stuff. You can see there's so many details. I appreciate the complexity of it, but I don't particularly like that sort of stuff. Ottoman can also relate to Ottoman Empire. Well, that's what it comes from. Yeah, the Ottoman is the word. And then from that, we get various uses. Ottoman architecture or Ottoman home decor style would be related to back to that. And also an Ottoman somehow connects to that too. Although exactly, I'm not sure how. Yes. Uh, Alejandro says, we don't have those wooden beams here at home since the entire house is made out of cement. Interesting. But in Chile, where I'm where I am, it's more common. Okay, so cement homes. That's another interesting thing about the um, the sort of materials used. So uh, Stephanie says here houses have beams. Those hard um, those hard wood used to support um, the wood in the ceiling. Alejandro, do you guys have that too? So um, a lot of houses here are wood frame houses. And so if you take away everything, it looks like this. So the house is made of not large wooden beams, but a bunch of small pieces of wood uh, called two by fours or two by sixes. And they f what's called frame the house. So essentially they'll build 
the structure of the house, this phase of the home home is known as framing. And this is this is probably the most common in in America. They do the framing and then at the end of the framing, um, it'll it'll look something like this with and then they'll do the the sort of they'll do a flat boards to make the walls, but the framing is just the basic bones of the house and then they'll do the plumbing, the electrical work, all of that stuff and then after that stage it's the is drywall. So uh, electrical and plumbing in a house. Let's see if we can get, excuse me. So yeah, after, after the framing, then you would do this part where you're essentially running all of the lines uh, that the house will need, the internet, the electrical, the pipes, the, the plumbing that will, you know, uh, after you use the toilet or bring water to the sinks, and you see these lines going through the whole thing. I got to see it at every stage of the process, which was really interesting. We were there for the framing, and then after the framing, the 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 pipes. It was really a really cool, a really cool process. Then uh, you do drywall, and then drywall, or sometimes it's called sheet rock, is the actual wall itself. And these are large pieces that are basically attached to the walls, and then they. Um, cover the cracks between them with uh, plaster and then they paint over that. So this this is the drywall with the plaster uh, um, between covering up the uh, the cracks between the drywall sheets and then they'll paint over this. You can see they've left holes for light fixtures and sockets and heating there. This is a good example because it kind of shows everything. So this is right after they put the sheetrock or the drywall on. There's a heating duct or vent. There's there's another one over here. There's a electrical socket, electrical socket. They have the windows in. There's a lights, a light. Um, this is a light fixture. They have lights there. And so then the next stage would be to put the lights in, put the electrical in, and do the painting of the walls and the carpet or the wood floors. Now, I do want to go to the kitchen because I said we we're going to spend a little time in the kitchens. I think it's important to, to spend a little time on that. Um, Heckel says, many Europeans laugh at Americans that they make their house from cardboard. Yeah, yeah I can understand that. I can understand that. I do. There is something kind of nice about, um, you know, a big stone house. I would love to have a house someday. My, I hope my next house. I want it to be made completely of giant stones. That's what I want. That'd be super cool. That would be super cool. Can't disagree with you there, Heckle. There's there's something kind of not super cool about um, the framing, but that's by far the most common type. I once punched through the drywall. I barely missed the beam. It hurt. <laughs> what made you so angry that you wanted to punch through the drywall? Wow, look at this. This this is this is like my dream aesthetic. Except for the gold. I mean, but this I love I love these I love the natural stone bricks here the wall is made out of the stone bricks right and i love the gray dark gray surfaces but it's not too clean it's kind of got a natural rough look to it i don't like the gold uh, i don't i but i like these natural wooden beams all of the natural colors dark colors stone colors rough surfaces but very well designed i like like besides the gold crap i would say that's that's awesome um, anything else? Okay, that's like industrial. Okay, kitchen, 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 kitchen. Don't get distracted. Get get it together, pretty. It's time to look at the kitchen. Okay, here's a good example. Here we go. From Martha Stewart. I recently found out that Martha Stewart is 80, over 80 years old. That blew my mind. I thought Martha Stewart was in her 60s. And then I found out she's 80. How old is she exactly? How old is Martha Stewart? 
81. She's 81. Jeez. She looks good for 81. Amazing. Okay, so here is what I would describe as a very ordinary kitchen. As we said, countertops. Okay, and the counter the countertop is made of different materials. You might have granite, marble, wood, or laminate. Those are the four materials. Granite is not as expensive as marble. Marble and granite are both stone, but marble is very pure, and it doesn't have a lot of uh, big chunks in it, I guess. It's a higher quality. Marble is very expensive. The next one down is granite. You can have a lot of different colors. There's white granite, brown granite, gray granite. A lot of color variation. And then laminate. You know what wood is. Laminate is sort of like, if you look at your desk, unless it's a solid wood desk, it's probably laminate. Okay, uh, A typical desk is either real wood or laminate. And I would guess most people have a laminate desk. Looking at this right now, this is I'm tapping on a laminate surface. My desk is laminate. Then you have several things that are common. This is the sink. And the sink has a thing that comes out where the water comes out of, and that is called the faucet. So the sink is the whole area. That's what we call the sink, go to the sink. But also the sink is the basin that the water goes into where you wash your dishes. But a lot of people don't like to wash dishes by hand. Instead, they, especially if they have a larger family, like to use a dishwasher. The dishwasher is usually right next to the sink, embedded into the, uh, the cabinets under the counter. So the counter, and then you have these cabinets for storage, dishes, forks, knives, spoons, cutlery, we could call. Cutlery, forks, knives, spoons, that stuff, that's called cutlery, but it's also called flatware. So you have a dishwasher. Usually it's very near the sink because you want to take things from the sink and put them in the dishwasher very easily. I don't want that to be too far away. So that's usually not directly under the sink, but usually right next to it on the left or on the right. You load things, you rinse them off very quickly, and then you load them in the dishwasher. A load of dishes may go for two hours and then you take them out and they're totally clean. Um, and most homes will have a dishwasher. Then you have, and they might be connected, they might be separate. You have a stove or stove top and then an oven. Now in this kitchen, you can't see it completely. We'll look at another example, but we have a stove and oven that they're connected. And often you'll see that stove is on top, oven on the bottom. So you can bake stuff or roast stuff in the oven and then you cook stuff with a pan and a spatula, eggs, whatever, on the stovetop. And that might be electrical or flame. So some people have a flame stovetop uh, that well, you're, there's actually fire, right? And then some people will have an electrical one. I definitely like the, the, the flame one, fire one. I like to see the fire, right? I like to see how long I can hold my hand there. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, but sometimes those are separate. So sometimes your this house apparently does not have an island. But if it has an island, then you might have the stovetop on the island. Or you might have the kitchen sink on the island. But let's say you have the stovetop on the island. In the middle of the island, the island around it, countertop around it, on the opposite, opposite side of that, then you have stools. And then underneath is just cabinets. And then the oven is somewhere else. Like in my house, they're not attached. The stovetop is in the middle of the island and the oven is over there. <laughs> so that's really common. Let's see if we can get a better, a better picture of that. Let's see here. Um, okay, uh, okay. This is not a great example of what I just said, but we can get another view here. We can get another view. This was always so small. What the heck? Click. I don't want to see this. 
Why, why is it like this? Why is it so small? What is going on? Someone's blending something. Mushroom is using the blender downstairs. I don't know if you can hear that. Uh, um, well, okay, here, here, nope. Thought I had something. Okay, here's, here, here we go. Okay, now in this one, this is a very nice kitchen. You can see that there, there's the island. The island is separate from everything else. And then the sink is in the island. And the stovetop is over the, probably over the oven. But it could be the other way around. It could be that the stovetop is in the island and the sink is somewhere else. And they're both, I would say both common. I couldn't tell you which one is more common, but I'm just trying to express the idea that the stovetop does not have to necessarily be over the oven, although I'm not have I'm having trouble finding examples of that. I'm having trouble finding examples. Um, let's see stove top in on in on island. Okay, let's see that. Let's look at that. Okay. I, Uh, here, ooh, ah, here we go. There we go. That's, 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 that's it. So here you have an, a, an oven totally separately c embedded in the cabinets. And then you have the island, probably some stools here on the left we can't see. Then you have the stovetop where you can cook. The ventilation above it, that's called the range, R-A-N-G-E. And then you have... Uh, the sink behind and the dishwasher right behind that. I mean, that's the standard layout. That's very common. This is almost exactly the layout that I have as well. That's pretty common. Okay, that one still has the oven beneath. So it d doesn't really matter where the oven is. There, that's another another example there. The kitchen island um, at the range, dishwasher, sink. I feel like that's awkward because you have, you have this... Uh, you cook here and then you have to go all the way around to the sink because you want to travel back and forth between the sink and the when you're cooking the sink and the stovetop I feel like that's very awkward placement you want to just turn around and be at the sink when you're washing vegetables and things right I feel like that's extremely awkward but whatever who am I to say who am I to say there's another one okay so I think that about covers it. Uh, maybe we can just quickly look at Zillow, just to, just to play around on Zillow. Okay, so Zillow is a, a website for finding um, apartments and homes. And let's look at... Uh, Let's look in New York City. Okay. And let's just browse around for a couple of minutes. I want to actually not find homes for sale. Let's find let's first find homes for rent if you're curious about rent. All right. So rent And we're going to do any price. And let's be more specific. Let's look in uh, Jackson Heights, New York. This is in Queens. All right. All right. Here we go. For rent, any price, any beds, uh, houses, apartments, condos, any, any type, any move-in day. All right. And okay, so here we've got two bedrooms, one bathroom. So just, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you see 2BA, 1BA or 2BD, 1BA, well, it used to be uh, whatever. It used to be 2BR, BR, BR. Now it's BDBA. They changed it. It used to be BR, BR for both of them. 
So here we have what looks like an open floor plan apartment in Elmhurst, New York for $2,500 per month. There's the floor plan. It looks like it has an, a separate bedroom and it may be in a house. It might be in, a, in, a, in an actual house. The floor plan is like that. Bedroom. Oh, yeah, two bedrooms. Then you have the living room and kitchen combined. Open floor plan. So reasonably nice. 800 square feet. And that's $2,500 a month. What do you think about that? Is that expensive? Is that cheap? I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Let's see here. We have a three-bedroom, two-bathroom, 1,728-square-foot apartment. It's a single-family home. Oh, so it's a home. Okay. Uh, or at least maybe home-like. I'm not sure if it's a, what it is, but it looks like it needs some help. Uh, not bad, but 4200 a month for three bedrooms, two bathrooms. $4,200 a month. Uh, the rent is paid monthly. So we're not talking about $4,200 a year. That's $4,200 per month. Per month. And you're not even in... You're not even in the city. I mean, you still... If you live here in Flushing, you are a 45-minute subway ride into the city. My rent when I lived in Queens, and it was considered cheap at the time, was people heard my rent and they went, oh, wow, nice. My rent for my two-bedroom apartment in Queens, not Manhattan, was $2,000 a month. If you live in Manhattan and you pay $4,500 for a one-bedroom apartment or a studio apartment, if you pay $5,000 for a nice studio apartment or one-bedroom apartment in Manhattan, nobody's going to say, oh, wow, so expensive. People will say, well, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> so rent in New York City is very expensive. Very expensive. So you're spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per year to rent. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's look to buy then for sale. In Jackson Heights. Let's see what we can get for a million dollars. All right. So a million dollars in Elmhurst, in, in Queens, gets you four bedrooms, three bathrooms. Looks like one parking spot here in an attached home, meaning that it's connected to other homes. So it's multifamily, meaning someone lives here, someone lives here. Each of these is over a million dollars probably. And you can see, I mean, is that is that luxury? Is that super nice? You tell me. I don't think so. It's pretty normal, right? It's not crazy, right? Small, pretty small. They don't even list how many square feet. And if they don't list how many square feet, that means it's not a lot. <laughs> That's what that means. If If the square footage is not listed... It's not a lot. <laughs> that means they're shy about it. Look how tiny the kitchen is. Okay, so we're paying a million dollars for this. Nothing wrong with this. No shame, right? Uh, nothing wrong with it. But it's small for a million dollars. It's paying a million dollars for a kitchen that you would find in a student's dormitory. So being an owner of an entire apartment building in New York could make you rich. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If you live in, if you own an apartment building in New York City, you you probably are rich. Absolutely. Is that a million dollars in a lifetime? No, I mean, if you want to buy this, you have to pay a million dollars. And by the way, when I saw this, I, I just clicked on the first one, right? This is normal. I mean, this is not crazy. Here's another one. Again, does that look super nice? One million dollars. You get to live in that. Nothing wrong with it. 
but in a lot of other places in, in the world, in the country, in fact, this would be way, way less, okay? Now, let's see. Let's just take a quick look at what a million dollars gets you in... another state okay and I'm just going to pick one I'm just gonna pick one we're gonna go to Wichita Kansas Kansas is a state in the United States it's known as being you know not a place with a lot of gigantic cities Kansas City of course but you know so let's let's see that. So we're here on Zillow. Now we're going to go to price and we're going to click. We only want to see houses that are around a million dollars here. So I'm going to go at least I want to spend at least nine hundred thousand dollars on a house, right? OK, so here. We have a house for, and this is also in the United States, right? 1.3 million. All right, let's see what we get. Six bedrooms, seven bathrooms, 7,500 square feet, a huge yard surrounded by trees. Got some neighbors close by, but nice. Giant fireplace, huge living room, gigantic kitchen. Again, seven bathrooms, a huge laundry room, beautiful bedrooms, stone floors, right? This looks like granite, a gigantic a, a ping pong table. This is a movie theater. This is a movie theater. <laughs> and this is only a little bit more than that, what we were looking at in Queens, right? Look at this back patio. Amazing, right? This is what we get for a million dollars in Kansas. Let's look at, I'm tempted to click on this for, for, for only 1 million, not only, but I mean, this is 8,600 square feet for $2.2 .2 million. This is what you get. Unbelievable. $2.2 .2 million in New York will get you about, you know, about what we were looking at before. It's not going to go up to luxury. But here is clearly a luxury home, a very, it's got a movie theater, a home gym, pool, beautiful yard, fireplace area, beautiful. If we can, okay, here's, I want to see, I'm going to get as close to 1 million as we can. All right, here's 949. 949,000, 4,800 square feet, five bedrooms, five bathrooms, by the water, by a beach, very big, very nice, right? So I I just wanted to say, you know, the, the range here, New York City is the exception. New York City is insanely expensive. If you want a very nice house in New York City, very nice, you have to spend at least $4 million dollars. If you want to just get anything in New York City, you have to spend at least a million, which is insane, right? <laughs> so if you move out, then in the surrounding areas or other cities or other states, you can get much more for much less, right? You can get what we looked at in Flushing. That place somewhere else would probably be like $200,000, not that much, which is cheap for a house. Yulin says, I think the house price in Shanghai is even much more expensive than that. Right. In Shanghai, the prices are insane. If you think this is a lot, look in Shanghai. In Shanghai, you want to buy a two-bedroom apartment in downtown Shanghai. It's, you know, it's like $4 million. It's, it's, I have no idea how people afford it. Yulin, how do people afford that is my question. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. So there you go. Uh, we've really explored a lot today. Thank you all for joining. This has been really fun and really interesting. I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate. I, I so so. Let me again state what 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 the project is. 
on Wednesdays, we're going to do more in-depth Englishy stuff, right? Planned lessons, idioms, slide decks, blackboard, that sort of thing. And so if you like to learn more sort of direct, directly pumping knowledge into your brain, uh, Wednesday. Fridays are going to be a little bit more freestyle where I, I hope we can get to a point where we're kind of all hanging out in a sense together. Uh, you know, so the participation has been great. The ideas uh, in the in the chat has been fantastic. Just sort of exploring a topic and learning through that, of course, but more exploratory, a little more freestyle. And then on Saturday, Mushroom and I will be having our conversations. So we're, Mushroom and I will be here tomorrow. Feel free to join for that, okay? So uh, thanks for joining. If you haven't already done so, I would really appreciate if you could hit the like or thumbs up button or wherever you can show support, do that. It's a small action you can take, which actually makes a big difference to the algorithms that show what I do to other people as well. So I would greatly appreciate that. And uh, if you haven't already done so, you can also grab a free course in the links in the description. The first one is a free course, but you can check out my other courses too. Uh, you can get a monthly membership or a yearly membership to access all my courses. If you are looking to improve your pronunciation, uh, learn about idioms, grammar, writing, all of that stuff, check that out as well. And what else? That's it, I think. Thank you all so much for joining. It's been really great. I really enjoy enjoy doing this. And I hope you have a fantastic weekend. I hope to see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have fun. Uh, if you want to share your pictures of your house, uh, you can do that in the Discord. That's free to join. You're welcome to do that. Um, I'm also happy to share pictures if you ask. If you don't, I won't. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. I hope you have a good one. Take care and see you later.